Hello. We're going to be in the conclusion chapter of the Upper Room Discourses. And I guess it's one of the high, holy moments of Jesus praying for us in a real sense. This is often called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. I think it's the true Lord's Prayer because Matthew 6 is more uh, the model prayer. In this prayer, Jesus seems to uh, speak about his own glorification in verses 1 through 5. In verses 6 through about 19, he seems to speak about the apostles and their ministry. And then in verses 20 through 26, he talks about those of us who will come after them, who will believe their message. So it's a, a prayer for his people, uh, a prayer for the hours that are immediately ahead when the major facts of the gospel are going to be finished. There is not one conditional sentence in all of chapter 17. This is not a time of discouragement for Jesus. If you'll look at chapter 16, verse 33, I believe, let's see, yeah, verse 33, he says, I have overcome the world. Men, I've overcome it. Hang in there. And so this, this is not a prayer of defeat or of discouragement or even a prayer of conditional. If you will, I will. He's just saying, men, I'm going to tell you how it's going to be, and then I'm going to pray that you'll do the appropriate thing. And that's what chapter 17 is all about. It is a marvelous chapter. And I hope you hear the one who sits at God's right hand praying for you in this chapter. Let's begin then in verses 1 through 5 where he talks about his glorification. When Jesus had said all these things, he lifted his eyes to heaven. Now remember, I always get tickled at us. We, we bow our heads and fold our hands to pray. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the traditional Jewish form of prayer was the hands lifted and the eyes lifted to heaven. We see that several times in the Old Testament, like one example of many, Psalms 123, verse 1. We see the same thing in the Gospels. John 11:41, Mark 7, 34 is the same idea. I think we get that thing about bowing our heads and closing our eyes from the parable of the Pharisee and the sinner. And I've always thought if we're going to bow our heads, we might as well beat our breasts too, because that's the, what the sinner also does. But we have never picked up on that part of it, have we? Now then it says, and, the, uh, and said, Father, the time has come. This idea about the time or the hour is a very important thing with Jesus. It's mentioned in chapter 2, verse 4, 7, 30, 8, 20. Now what it means is that Jesus knew the purpose and timing of his life. He was aware of God's purpose and plan for him every step of the way. Nothing took him by surprise, if you please, even the Garden of Gethsemane arrest and the crucifixion by the Romans. Now, notice where it says, glorify your son. Now, this is an aorist active imperative, which speaks of once and for all, God, you yourself glorify me. Now, in chapters 12, verse 33, excuse me, 23 and following, in chapter 13, verse 31 and 32, it is obvious that the glorification there is the crucifixion. In John, whenever Jesus talks about his death, he always calls it glorification. In John 3, 14, he even says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And the idea there is highly exalted. So we get the idea that for Jesus, his coming to die was the essence of God being glorified in him. And yet he's going to say that we are to be glorified uh, in the sense that we are to glorify him. So it obviously there does not refer to our sacrificial death. So the word glory has that double meaning that so many terms do in John. It can mean his death, and it can mean his pre-existent state as the glory that he had with the Father before the world was created. And that's something of the glory that he wants us to see and to share. Isn't that amazing? Now, notice if you would where it says, by the way, throughout this chapter there are several key words. Let me give them to you right here at first, so when we come to them, you'll see those themes repeated. It's very difficult to outline this chapter because these same motifs, these key words, are repeated over and over. The word glorify is a key word. The word knowing, knowing God, is a key word. The word the world is used 18 times in here. Then in the name of is used through here. And finally, that they may be one, that they may have unity. And those are the key thoughts throughout this passage. Okay, now, let's go to verse 2. Uh, Just as you have given him authority over all mankind. What a tremendous thing for Jesus to say. What an absolutely inappropriate thing for a human being to say. Now, if you might want to see uh, John chapter 11, verse 27, uh, Matthew 28, 18, Excuse me, it's 
Matthew eleven twenty seven, Matthew twenty eight eighteen, and John five twenty seven is where Jesus says, "All authority has been given unto me." Boy, isn't that good to know that our lives are in the hands of one who has all authority on heaven and earth? Now he continues to give eternal life. Now, this idea of eternal life is the special word zoe. There are two words in Greek for uh, life. Zoe, we get the word zoology, and bios, we get the term biology. Bios in John, particularly, always refers to human life, worldly life, animal life. Zoe always refers to resurrection life, the life of the age to come, God's kind of life. And that's what it is here. Some think that verse 3 is really the apostle's definition of eternal life because it uses Jesus Christ. And some think it'd be an approach for Jesus to use that for himself in a context like this. There's much debate about verse 3, and when we get to it, I'll show you different translations that depend on which view you uh, determine you believe. The next little phrase in verse 2, though, is, to all whom you have given him. This is an emphasis on election that those who come to respond to the message originally are God the Father's who've been given to Jesus the Son. Boy, I love to speak about election. The darkest day of your life when things aren't going well to know that God called you before the foundation of the, of the world and wrote your name in the book of life will give you courage when nothing else will. I believe the doctrine of predestination or election is primarily a doctrine for the church, not a doctrine to keep lost people out. You might want to read Ephesians chapter 1, that great prayer that begins in verse 3 and goes through 14. In this particular chapter, the verse 2, verse 6, and verse 9 emphasize the electing, predestining, foreknowing power of God in our lives. Then it continues, and here's, here's the controversy about is verse 3 a parenthesis to describe eternal life or a continuation of Jesus' dialogue? Now, eternal life means this. He's going to give two things. Both the things that are mentioned in verse 3 are crucial tenets of Christianity. The first thing we believe, knowing as uh, you as the only true God. Now, this is a, a reference to monotheism. We believe in one and only one God. Christianity does not have three gods. We believe in one God. We follow the Jewish prayer of monotheism in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 6, the Shema. So we believe that God is the only true God. There are a lot of false gods and false idols. There is only one living God, and that is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Now, the second major tenet here is knowing Jesus, your messenger, as Christ. Now, Williams is getting very interpretive. It simply means knowing Jesus Christ. Now, some say if John is referring to it, it means Jesus, and they assume, as the Christ. And that seems to be very valid to me. For we, you can't just be a deist or a theist and believe in one supreme being. Even being a monotheist does not make one a Christian. It's believing in one true God and then believing that Jesus is the divine human Messiah. Now, those two tenets are absolutely crucial in Christianity, and I think both are affirmed here. Now, it's important for me to also say the word knowing. Now, in, when we know God... Uh, the ancients used to debate, can you know God? The Greeks said, you cannot know God. Well, I think the Bible teaches that we can know God, not exhaustively or completely, but we can know him redemptively. We can know him relationally through Jesus Christ. And therefore, what we know about God through Jesus and the Bible is true, though it's not exhaustive. So knowing is primarily, the Greek term means intellectual. Now, there is an element that we cognitive, uh, cognitively understand God, but primarily the focus of the Hebraic background to the word knowing is intimate personal relationships. That's why we continue to affirm that Christianity is not the affirmation of true facts about God, but entering into a personal relationship with God. That's the Hebraic way of knowing, and you see it in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, where Adam knew Eve and she conceived intimate family terms used to describe God. That's when we call God Father and Jesus Son, that same uh, line there. Now, verse 4, I have glorified you. There's that same term down here. Well, obviously there it can't mean the crucifixion. It has to mean something else. And it seems to be connected with obedience and the will of God for Christ. Now, uh, here upon the earth, by completing the work which you have given me to do. Now, the implication here is perfectly completing the work. I think Jesus had three primary tasks to do. Number one was to reveal God to man. True revelation about what Father is. To see Jesus is to see God, and that's also in this context. Number two, to pay the price, the ransom for man's redemption. He came to die and to give his life a ransom for many. And then thirdly, I believe he came to give us an example 
of what redeemed humanity should be like. So Christ's likeness, following his example, is another goal of why he came to come, to reveal the Father, to die for our sins, to give us an example to follow. Now, then it continues when it says, So now, Father, glorify me up there in your presence just as you did before the world existed. Well, here is a strong affirmation of the full deity and preexistence of Jesus Christ. You might want to see John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. You might want to see John chapter 8, verse 58. You might want to see John 16, 28, John 17, verse 5, 11, 13, and 24 all assert this same truth. Ephesians, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 6 through 11 also is this same truth, that Jesus has always existed as God. Now, he, he only came to be a man at Bethlehem, but he has always been God, and he will continue to be the incarnated part of the Trinity. Now, verse 6, I have made your very self known to men whom you have given me out of the world. Now, that's William's translation. A little more literally, I have made known your name. A good place to see this is Psalms 9, 10, where the name represents the character of the person. What Jesus is saying is, I have fully revealed who you are, God, to your followers on earth, the believers in me. Now, we need to see John 1.18, Colossians 1.15, and Hebrews 1.3 for the affirmation that to see Jesus is to see God. And so by seeing the life of Jesus, hearing the teachings of Jesus, following the admonitions of Jesus, we are doing the will of God, and we know God because we know him. Then let's continue. By the way, we hit the word, the world, twice, but I want to pick up for it uh, down in um, verse 9. So I'm going to wait till I, to talk about that term till then. Now, notice it says, uh, At first they were yours, but now you have given them to me, and they have obeyed your message, and they have come to know that everything you have given me really belongs, really, really comes from you. Now, you might want to see uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 16, and Hebrews 1, 2 and 3. What that's saying is that we understand what God is by understanding what Jesus has told us and that we accept it and receive that message uh, and, is, and have come to obey it. For, everything, for I have given them the teachings that you gave to me. Now, Jesus said, I don't tell you my own words. I'm telling you what the Father told me. Now, we'll see John 7, 16, John 12, uh, 48 and 49. They have accepted them. And here is that uh, uh, very important double aspect of, of, of uh, accepting truth. We accept doctrinal truth that what Jesus told us is true about God, and we volitionally accept truth, which means we respond to it by faith in the person of Jesus Christ in instigating a relationship. The term faith in the New Testament can mean intellectual assent, doctrine, or it can mean fellowship, relationship, and here it seems to be a play on both, as John so often does. Now, they have come to know in reality that I did come from you, so, and they are convinced that you did send me. And here is the purpose of Jesus coming. I am praying for them. Now, in chapter 16, verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, I'm not going to pray for them because you love them and they can pray with you. But that's after he's gone back to heaven. Here he says, I want to pray for them one more time, Father. And, of course, it's good for me to know that the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, 26 and 27 prays for us. Here Jesus prays for us on earth. We know from 1 John 2, 1 that Jesus continues to intercede for us. We know from John 16, 27 the Father loves us as much as he ever could and we can come to him directly. we got all aspects of the Trinity on our behalf. Friends, <laughs> that's, that's quite a package deal. Now, notice where it mentions here then. Let's see. Um, I am not praying for the world now, but only for those whom you have given me. Now, the world is used 18 times in this chapter. That means it's a very important subject. First of all, he wants to explain to the disciples their relationship to the world. And then he wants to show them that he still loves and cares for the world. And their mission is to the world. They're to be in the world, not of the world, seems to be the emphasis here. In the writings of John, the term the world seems to be defined as human society organized and functioning apart from God. All national entities in our day uh, fit that bill. Now, notice where it says in verse 10, uh, and I have been glorified through them. This is a perfect passage. Isn't that a tremendous statement? That somehow at our feebling, faltering attempt to, to do the will of God, Jesus is glorified in us. Isn't that a marvelous promise? Wow, that we bring honor and glory to Jesus. It's also a tremendous 
responsibility. Verse 11, and now I'm no longer in the world, but they are to stay on in the world. We don't need little Christian social clubs where we get together and do our thing with other Christians. We are salt and light, and salt that's all piled up in a pile doesn't do what it's supposed to, and light that's all kept under a bushel doesn't do what it's supposed to. We are to permeate society without being affected by society. We don't need little Christian cliques. We need Christian missions, and that's what it's saying here. Now, it continues where it says then, um, uh, I'm going to be with you, Holy Father. Now, God's not called Father except three other times in the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 16 and Revelation 4, 8. The reason in the Old Testament he's called holy all the time. It seems in the New Testament that term is reserved for the Holy Spirit, and so it doesn't call God holy, uh, the Father, quite often. Now it says, keep them by thy power. Notice that's God's name, God's power, that protects the disciples. So that they may be one. This emphasis on unity is a major thrust of this prayer. In verses 21 through 23, it is emphasized again and again and again. Oh, to God that Christendom had a unity. Now, I'm not sure we're ever going to have denominational unity, a structured unity anymore, but we ought to have a unity of purpose, a unity of mind, a unity of fellowship, and a unity of uh, a sense of the mission of God in our world, and that ought to be a mark that we are one. The purpose of unity is always evangelism to reach the lost world. Now, it continues then. Let me see where it mentions. Um, and I protected them, and not one of them is lost. There's assurance, friend. Jesus has never lost anyone that God has given to him, except the one that, who is doomed to be lost. Now, the literal here is the son of perdition. This is used in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, as a description for the Antichrist. Here it's used of Judas Iscariot. God did not force him, but God used his foreknowledge to use Judas to fulfill his plan. He's doing that with Satan. He's going to do that with the Antichrist. God uses evil for his purpose for that ultimate day when evil will be eliminated from the presence of believers and from God's world. Now, notice where it says the scripture might be fulfilled. This seems to be a reference to Psalm 41, 9 that's quoted in John 13. So that, this seems to be it about Judas raising his heel against him. Um, notice it talks about the, their joy, which I experience, may be fully experienced in their own souls. We're not only to have joy, we're to have Jesus' joy. Now, friends, you don't get any better joy than that. You now we'll see chapter 15, verse 11. Then it says, I have given them your message, and the world has hated them. You now we'll see 15, 18 through 20. Because they do not belong to the world. You now we'll see 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Just as I do not belong to the world. And I am not asking you to take them out of the world, no, but to keep them from, now mine has the evil in it. But really, this form can be neuter or masculine. I believe in, in Matthew 6, 13, the Lord's Prayer, it really should be the evil one and not just evil. Now, notice what it says in verse uh, 16. Uh, they do not belong to the world, uh, as I do not belong to the world. Consecrate them by your truth. Your message is truth. This seems to be a quote from the Septuagint of Psalms 119, 142, verse 142. Now, the word consecrate, it's used in verse 19 of Jesus himself. Here it's used to the disciples. It's from the root holy. And it means to set apart for a specific task. I really mean, think it means to be called and equipped for a particular task by God. And so we are to be consecrated, sanctified, and it's an aorist active imperative. It's not, a, it's not a choice. It's a command by Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 18, just have you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We are people on a mission. We are not meant to sit around and talk about what theology means. We have been sent into a lost world with the same mission that Jesus was sent into the world for. We are a, a community of faith on active mission. And I think we need to hear that. We're not here just to, to enjoy each other and praise God, though those are important. But we are here to have a militant attack on the kingdom of the evil one in Jesus' name. And we need to hear that. We need to hear that. Missions is not the sideline of the church. It is the purpose of the church. You all see the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Now, it continues then in verse 20. I make this petition not for them only. Now, here we come to that section where he prays for us, those of us who did not see him in the flesh, but those of us who truly believe the message of the apostles and committed our whole life to following the one who we've read about and met by faith in our own lives. But for all who ever come to believe in me through their message. Well, that's us. What does he pray for us? For them to be one, just as you, Father, in union with me and I in union with you, for them to be in union with us so that the world may be convinced that you've sent me. Oh, to God, we need unity. 
That's what Jesus prayed for us as unity. That's what we do not have, neither in organization nor in spirit today. And the world keeps saying, I wonder which one of them is right when they ought to be saying, you'll know they're Christians by their love. Now, and their unity. Uh, I in union with them and you in union with me so that they may be perfectly united. Now, this is the ideal of perfected in unity. It's a paraphrastic, passive, passive, subjunctive, and it speaks of our being fully equipped to enter into unity. The world may be sure that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you have loved me. What a promise. Eris tense. God loves us the way he loved Jesus. Can you buy that? Chapter 16, verse 27. You are loved with the same intensity, the same essence, the same kind of love that God loved Jesus. And friends, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And God so loves the world that he'll give you to a lost world to try to bring him to know Christ. God's love is not a sentimental love that says, I'll protect you from every hurt and pain. The Bible says of Jesus in the book of Hebrews that he was perfected by the things that he suffered. God wants to use you. God wants to send you on a mission. He loves you with the same kind of love he has for Jesus. He wants you to know the unity that he and Jesus has, and then he'll send you into a lost and dying world to give everything you have that some may come to know him. Seems a paradox to us, but it's the truth of the gospel. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, it continues then. Father, I want those whom you have given me to be where I am. Oh, I'm glad he said that. That's chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. They're preparing a place for me and Jesus to live together. This is the promise of heaven. Jesus says, I don't want to experience all that glory unless you bring those with me that, I, that have trusted me. Woo! Friends, we're going to be there because Jesus wants us to be there. How about that? Then it continues. And all they may see the glory which you have given me. There's that pre-existence again. Because you love me before the creation of the world. I want to bless your bippy, and I don't have time to do it. So I want to give you some references for you to look up the things that God has already done for you in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. And that's the key little phrase. Get your pencil real quick. Write these down. Matthew 25, 34. Luke 11, 50. Ephesians 1, 4, Hebrews 4, 3, and 9, 26, 1 Peter 1, 20, Revelation 13, 8, Revelation 17, 8, and if I don't put you in orbit, you don't have a booster. <laughs> now, continues, righteous father, God's called holy and righteous in this chapter. He's just. And the fact that he's going to deal in Jesus Christ for the redemption of man, that one is going to die for the sins of many, shows the justness and fairness of God. Somehow in Calvary, the justice and mercy of God meet. Now, notice where it continues. Although the world did not know you. Now, they knew facts about God. They knew rituals about God. But they didn't have an interpersonal relationship that entered into unity and love for men. And that's what they missed. The word know through here is relational, not cognitive only. I did know you, and these men have come to know that you sent me, that I made known to them. Look at all that emphasis on know. Your very self. Now, literally, they're your name, your character. When they saw me, they know you. What is God like? He's like Jesus Christ. When you see him loving the children, when you see him raising the dead, when you see him opening blind eyes, when you see him hugging lepers, when you see him forgiving sinful people, you see God in action. Now, and I will make you known still further so that the love which you have shown me may be felt in them and I in union with them. And that the prayer closes. And in chapter 18, we're coming to the Garden of Gethsemane. I want to tell you about a, uh, an emphasis that we need to hear. Jesus has provided all that we need as far as knowledge of God. We do not need more facts about God, no more information about the Bible. We don't need to be all be scholars of Greek and Hebrew. What we need is to take the knowledge that we have and to go out in a sinful world and present the simple message that God loves you and sent his son to die on your behalf. And if you'll trust him by faith, he'll redeem you. He'll put his spirit in you. He'll cause you to become more like him. And one day he's going to come back to get you and take you home with him. Friends, Jesus, everything that God provided him to do his ministry. Listen to what I'm saying. Everything God provided Jesus to do his ministry, he has provided us. His spirit, the love of God, unity with the Father and the Son, the same mission. Hey, we have all that we need. The lost world is not on the doorstep of a reluctant God. 
It's on the doorstep of a reluctant church. A church that's so happy in her material prowess, a church that's so content in her social fun, a church that's more happy when she builds big monuments to herself and is beating the others in her area, needs to have a broken heart, needs to have the mind of Christ and the heart of God about a world that's lost and the eternality of that lostness. I hope this prayer, this high priestly prayer of Jesus, has said something to you about what Jesus wants for your life, about your intimate relationship with God, and about the purpose of why that you're saved now that he left you here. Hang in there, church. Go into all the world and make disciples. It will be worth it all. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again. Same time, same place, next week.